close. Thank you. Okay. We're on. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome, everybody. We have a big house, a full house, I should say. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have here today with us uh, Dr. Nali from uh, uh, Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Lee is an assistant uh, professor in electrical engineering, actually the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, but she's an electrical engineer, and uh, uh, she's been there since uh, 2014. Uh, previous to that, uh, she was uh, at uh, LIT home at MIT, and she got a PhD degree in control of dynamical systems from Caltech in uh, 2013. No, earlier than that. 2013. 2013. Yeah. And, and um, so the re research in interests are uh, in the general area of uh, controls of distributed network systems, uh, analysis, design, and uh, optimization. Uh, she was recently uh, an NSF Career Award uh, recipient. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, she also uh, was the best student uh, paper award in the 2011 uh, Control and Decision Conference in uh, IEEE. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid, for introduction, and thank you, for everyone, for coming to my talk. It's my pleasure to visit NC State. The weather is really nice compared with Boston, and the conference is really beautiful, and the people are really nice. So today I will talk about distributed energy management on the limited communication. Before talking, the doesn't work. No, it's not working. It works before anyway. I do want this, so it kills me. So I will try to use mine. It works before. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what like happened. Interesting. Does it work? Okay, okay. might it work. So I would like to thank. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I would like to thank all my collaborators. So the work is uh, like I start. Some work had been started when I was still a student. So uh, Chang Ho, my friend, Steven Lo, my advisor. And Li Jing Chen was my mentor. And then some of work at recent work done with my collaborators, Sinju and Carlo from KTH, my student Guan Nan, Xuan, Catherine, and Professor Chi Wen Du, and my mentor Wai Hit in Harvard. So let's start with a brief overview of Power Grid, in case some of you are now working on the smart grid. So in the power grid, the conventional operation done this way, the power plant is generating power power transmitted and distributed to the end users. So what's the ultimate goal? Ultimate goal to make sure supply equal demand all the time. And um, if we look at the demand side, as a consumer, we have a lot of freedom. Means we can make decisions by ourselves, decide when to use, how much to use. Unfortunately, the aggregate demand profile is predictable. What do I mean by aggregate demand profile de predictable? Look at this data. So for this data, for different day, we have the aggregate demand follow similar patterns. Because of the predicted behavior from demand, what we can do, we can control the generation side. And also, fortunately, most of power plants is controllable in the current grid. So we don't have a huge number of power plants, and all the power plants can be controlled. So for the control part, people using optimization tool, control tool, and market tool to make sure supply will equal demand all the time. That's the current scheme. It's a vertical structure. What's the problem? So the problem to improve the sustainability, we try to install more and more renewable energy in the systems. So this map shows how much renewable energy has been installed in the United States. We can see different states have different goals, and some states are very aggressive. For example, in Hawaii, 40%. In California, 33%. What's the problem here? Everyone is familiar with the uncertainty of renewable energy. When we try to use the wind or the solar, how much is generated is not fully controlled by the humans. So take the wind as an example. For different day, the wind fluctuation has different patterns. It's not predictable. And we look at the solar generation. For the solar, if a cloud comes, the solar generation can drop immediately within seconds. 
So those problems cause the difficulty how we are going to control the generation if we still want to control the generation. Another difficulty, in order to make sure we can harvest renewable energy all the place, we tend to deploy the renewable energy plant all over the place. And this plot shows how Denmark tried to install the renewable energy. We can see the number increase, the size decrease, the structure become more distributed. Put all the things together, let me summarize. So what's going to be happen? So what is happening for the current grid? In the supply side, it becomes less controllable and has a lot of uncertainty. And also the size becomes less, much larger scale and become distributed. So that's what happens for the generation side. What's the solution we have? Definitely we can put the algorithm. Another solution people try to propose. So everyone heard about demand response. So one way now we can try to call for everyone's help. So we try to make sure to make some demand to from unresponsive to responsive. What are the examples? We have demand pro response program and we have the storage and we can also like <coughs> electrical vehicle, and for the computer science, people can use data center to try to coordinate. Together with the solar PV and the wind turbine in the systems, put them together, people usually call those as distributed energy resources. So now we put everything together, think about what the future grid. For the future grid, we are going to have a huge number of active points, different distributed energy resources in the systems. This is good to improve the system sustainability, energy efficiency, power reliability. But the difficulty is, let's imagine if all the nodes keep changing and we don't know what the node is going to change. That means we will have millions or even billions of active points will keep changing their decisions, introducing the different fluctuations, supply, demand, voltage, frequency, everything. The difficulty is now to think about how we're going to coordinate those different elements to guarantee the global system performance. So one solution, now also people heard Internet of Things. So one solution, we can make use the Internet of Things, make everything be connected through the communication network. So different devices can talk to each other and we have different communication protocol at different layer. So if we think about we have Internet of Things, what people are trying to say, now we can coordinate all the generation, all the consumption together to communicate, coordinate some objective, for example, try to maximize the social welfare or try to maximize the profit. It also satisfy the operation constraint because this is a system power grid. We don't want to the system to be crushed. So we want to guarantee certain constraints be satisfied. So this is some like vision people have. We can use the IoT to ensure the system's operation. But let's take a deep look. How are we going to do it? So people like one Master people proposing is we can use the distributed optimization or distributed control tools. What distributed optimization is? So think all the algorithms, some few has a distributed optimization background, that's communication network background. So typical people assume this. Element can sensing and then communicate, then compute, then communicate again until some solution has been reached and the solution is everyone agrees on. That is the efficient point we should take. Downline's assumption is what? We assume we have a sensing, computation, and communication ability for the power grid. So that's online assumption we have. So let's take a one challenge. So we see we have three components. In this talk, we focus on the last one, communication. Take a deep thinking about communication. So what the communication challenges have? I put some examples. Some examples, like I think this phase also almost happened to me every day because my home don't have very good wireless cover. So we internet, if we try to use the internet to coordinate everything or some Wi-Fi wireless, so we lack reliability. Sometimes when the package is lost, it causes more delay to wait for a new package to come. And people talk about the security, like a lot of people try to interest in to get some data from the internet. We try to come not my home with the internet, we have also the leak in the privacy concern. So let's think about another thing. We are not going to use the wireless. We are not going to use in the internet. So some people say, let's use the power line communication or the radio frequency, the low power radio frequency. Both of them have limitation. It's a limited bandwidth. We don't have that much communication resource we have. Another solution, let's try to lay fiber building a new communication network just for the power grid. You can imagine that we have lots of deployment costs. It's not going to happen. So what we can do? 
So we have a definitely to address communication challenges, we can come up with different algorithm to say how robust my algorithm is, how efficient my algorithm is. So in this talk, we take these questions. The question we want to answer is, just think about, go back to the algorithm design. It is possible for us to design algorithms using very little communication. And if we are able to do that, we can think about, like, I don't need many information passing along with different devices. That will address the delay question, will also address the bandwidth questions. Definitely, we're also going to guarantee the privacy. So that's a question we try to think. How we can reduce the communication, but still, we want to guarantee the efficiency, we want to guarantee the system reliability. What we can do? So, like, it's a physical system, we don't have magic here. So we think about what we have from the physical systems. So first tool we think about is, since it's a physical system connected, come from a control theory, control people are always talking about state feedback control, closed loop control. Like, how about we don't communicate? Since I can measure some physical measurement, it is possible for me to just extract the information from the measurement instead of communication from others. So that's the first tool we can think about, using some control idea, do the state feedback control. Um, besides that, like some of you, if you have a control background, you can think about closed loop control is not everything. Still some, we need a, probably some global information. So the next question is, can we just think about a mathematical tool? Is it is possible for me to improve the algorithm to reduce the computation, to reduce the communication? So those are the two ideas we have. And let's see what is work or not going to work. So in the first, so this is tells you what the following I'm going to talk about. I will tell you using some examples to say how these two big ideas are going to help us reduce the communication. For the first one, we'll focus on very concrete example, load frequency control. And another one is a power allocation within a different, within a building. For the second one, we focus on the quantized algorithm how we can quantize the system, but still to guarantee the system performance. Let's look at the first one, how we are going to extract the information from the physical measurement. And we talk about frequency control. Some background, what the frequency control is in power grid. In the power grid operation, this is what happens like in conventional control operation. So we have a, have a different time scale. The slow time scale is we can do unit commitment to decide which power plant to turn on. And then we can use optimization tool, economy dispatch, to determine how much generation to schedule, generate to schedule. And this one is for the control part. At the real time, how I'm going to guarantee the real time supply and demand balance. So this traditionally is the frequency control done in this way. And traditionally, also this is only done in the generation, as I said. Only in the generation is being controlled. So this is example show how the frequency control work in practice. This is an example in Texas, when there is a big new clear plant fails. And to, in order to guarantee system reliability, we want to guarantee frequency is above certain threshold. When there is a big generation drop, the frequency drop immediately and below the threshold. You can see from the traditional operation, it takes time, like around 10 minutes, to ramping up the frequency back to the value that we want. Now imagine if we, like the California, want to have 33% renewable energy. That means this thing that happens all the time is definitely going to hurt the system, hurt the power grid. So then we take a think how, we, how the load control can help. So what we think about load control. So load control, first, everything, almost everything is electronics. It's much faster, almost no inertia. And no waste, it's just reduce, change the demand more resource, and we almost, like every generation or every changes, we have the load nearby, we can localize the disturbance. So this motivates us to focus on the load control. The idea actually traced back very, like, 1970s. Power people already think about how we can do the load control to help the grid. So let's look at the question, what do we want to achieve? Uh, we want, first, we want to control the load. The objective is, first thing, definitely guarantee the generation and the supply, <coughs> generation and load balance. The other two questions, I want to keep the frequent deviation small in order to improve the system's reliability. I want to minimize aggregated load disutility because here I ask people to coordinate. 
I want to minimize the discomfortability from the users. You can imagine what I'm going to do next. I kind of put all the problem in terms of optimization language. So this is the objective we want to achieve. So we want to balance the power at each basis, and we want to minimize the disuntainty from customer, and we want to minimize the frequency. So here, I had the node I. So node I, you can think about is a bus or is an area, like think about is a campus. So for different node, different areas connect to each other. So here, I want to guarantee for each area or each bus to guarantee the power balance. So this, I can formulate as a optimization problem. And this optimization problem, if you just look at it, is if I assume this is convex, it's a convex optimization problem, linear constraint. Looks very simple to solve. One day the disturbance happens. And if I want to put millions or billions of nodes in the system, I can use the distributed optimization tool. For example, use the ADMM to coordinate different appliances. But what's the problem? The problem, look at the problem formulation I have here. I said, assume now system is fluctuating, that something is changing. That means when I solve the optimization problem, I need to know all the information. I need to know what the new generation is or what the new changes is. That means, first one, I need to know what's happening. I need to know the real-time disturbance. Is this possible to get? Think about if in a, within a big campus, I have a, like multiple renewable energy at different place. How am I able to know the real-time renewable generation immediately? This is questionable. Secondly, it's heavily rely on the coordination between different devices. So different devices need communicate, compute action all the time, then to find the solution. It will take time. By the time I solve the problem, the problem already changed. So the question, can the load can I design the load control? Only response questions. So I'm wondering, would that be possible to add some hardware into the system? So that, for example, if you have a really, really big battery that you can charge or uncharge, and um, that'll take care of these higher frequency types of things, and then a level of minutes, as you were saying, and then you run your optimizer, and maybe you have like a hydroelectric dam that you pump up, you pump down, whatever. So yeah. I wonder if it's possible using this, that type of uh, so, good question. Uh, in theory, and also, if we have a big, big storage, and if the storage can ramping up and ramping down very fast, it will solve a lot of problems. A lot of problems like, probably doesn't exist. But still, some issues is when we think about big battery or uh, small battery at different house. For the big battery, we need to put the big battery in one location. Right, even I need the big battery to absorb all the fluctuation, and this means all the like power probably need to go to that location. And the power grid will again put another physical constraint. Even we have big battery still has a problem, how are we going to like understand? So I didn't model the network constraint in the system, but in practice it has the power network constraint and the power network, the transmission line has a constraint. It's still not going to solve the problem. And then if we go to the small battery at different location, then question goes into this way. Uh, because each battery has its own capacity. Yeah, but that's uh, always a good discussion when people ask about the uh, value of storage, is like what we can do if we have that kind of, assume we have that technology. Yeah. So let's continue for this. So now that the question is like just the constraint we put now. So I want each load to know what they can do by doing the measurement, taking some local physical measurement, and they can run like response in real time. Don't wait for other people to tell me. Can I do something? So I said, like, we are going to use the network dynamic, take the network measurement. First, we want to understand the network dynamics, how different nodes connect with each other, how different nodes affect each other. So this is a simple that dynamics model we take, is the frequency dynamics, capture for each bus how the frequency is going to change. So each eye is, as I said, aggregated bus or control area or some balance authority. So for this model, like, M is inertia, the omega is a frequency. That's the frequency I showed you guys. It's an immediate drop. And it's a mechanical power generation. And this is frequency sensitive loads. This is frequency sensitive loads, and this is the power flow. So how different buses connected through the power flow. Um, so this is the way we model the power flow, how different nodes connect to each other. So when one node frequency changes, the power flow is going to change, and the power flow is going to change the other 
frequency at the other buses. I definitely have some assumptions when we derive the analysis, but I can show when we do the real simulation, we put the whole complex nonlinear model and also including some other control part we did a model in the model, but still work. So this is, uh, as a recap, for the analysis, we take this simple model to start, to continue in. Frequency model capture when there is disturbance, how the frequency is going to change, and the power flow connect different buses together. So I said, like, let's assume there's some generation changes. How are we going to design the load control to coordinate the system, to guarantee the system is minimized this utility, minimize frequency deviation, but still guarantee the power balance. So how are we going to do it? So I'm not going to tell you the mathematical like procedure. So this is the result. For the result is, this is system dynamics. Like we don't do anything, this is system dynamics. This is just a model with for the analysis. So this is the controller we are going to build. So controller we are going to have is, we call it the frequency load control, what the frequency load control is. So this one, this is a frequency. Look at here, this is omega i. So this is a local frequency. And this is C is some local density function, like every person has different utility function. And this is how much load each person can change. So the load control is totally decentralized, only based on the frequency value. What do we can guarantee? We actually can guarantee system dynamics plus load control. Now you can see this is a dynamical system adding some control. And uh, we can guarantee the system going to converge to the optimal solution formulated as optimal load control problem. And how are we going to prove it? Turns out the two part together is optimization algorithm of solving this problem. So don't you understand what the primal dual partial gradient algorithm is? This is the algorithm to solve optimization problem. So that's how we can guarantee together solve this problem, converge to the whole solution. So this is a theoretical result. We can show system dynamics plus control going to converge to the optimal solution. Optimal solution, first is the unique solution to the optimal load control problem. And we can guarantee the frequency. Everyone's frequency will synchronize. That's important for the machine. For that. <coughs> and the power flow is also feasible power flow. So that's what we can guarantee by using the simple load control. So let's put them together. Think about how we're going to use our control tool. As I said, why I can put all the difficulty model, like this is a real system. And this is additional system I'm going to have. For the system, measure the frequency using the control algorithm that I just showed is very simple. And decide what the new load should be feedback to the new systems. It's very simple to use. Everyone can almost ignore what the other person is doing. And the coordination is done by the frequency signal itself. The message is the frequency here already serves as a coordination signal. You can say it's a kind of pricing signal telling each other what they should do. And this one completely decentralized. I even don't need a communication. So now this one will adjust communication challenges. Let's see how it works in the system. So we did a simulation. So we take the simulation, the IEEE 68 task system with the New England. So this is a tool we use, power system, the PST tool we use. And it has a detailed generation model of this system, even I didn't like, model it in my analysis, and all, all those are detailed model. And we also, the power flow in this case is the nonlinear, like follow the cocoa flow. And we put some disturbance at certain buses, and then to think about how the other load is going to change. So this is from the simulation result. From the simulation result, so OLC means our control, optimal load control. So we can see with our load control is actually driving the frequency to a better value, like close to the 60 nominal value. It also even improves the transient behave. Even the analysis, I did an exact model how we're going to improve the transient analysis. I just say, can I improve the steady state? As a bad product, we also got better smooth transient behave. And that's still some study. We're trying to understand how exactly to improve the transient, how to capture this phenomena that we didn't capture from our analysis. So this is on the frequency. And secondly, as I said, we do optimal load control because we want to optimize the disutility. So we can see from here, our optimal load control actually optimizes the load disutility. So that's almost like tells you how we can do the load frequency control. As a recap, so some, because when I present this work, people will ask, this is a special case. Like you have a, some special like model to do that. 
So the question then we would think about is how general the approach is, because in power system, it's not just the load frequency control. We have some other like automatic generation control, also the voltage control. Can we generalize the tool to some other problem, even some problem outside the power grid? So then we think about the question, change the question to this way. Given network dynamics, so this uh, each node is uh, like node in the network has some dynamics, and each person will connect to each other, some controller and some disturbance, some disturbance from outside. Is it possible to design the distributed, also closed loop control to solve the position problem? And this is like some position we come, like some cost function on the state, on the controller, and guarantee the physical constraint. So I'm not going to tell you the details in this talk. What I want to say is, first, we generate this approach to the automatic generation control in the power system. It works very nice. We call it economic automatic generation control. And secondly, we have a necessary and sufficient condition to tell people when our method can be used, what kind of property I need for the network dynamics. And that actually tells people how special the power grid is. So let's end the first part, the load frequency control. So as I said, we also generate the work to the voltage control. We have this like fully decentralized voltage control for distribution network. It also works nice. And secondly, let's more totally like different focus. So some questions when you think about the talk I gave before, I keep saying, think about each node as the campus, because that's when I can measure the transmission level frequency measurement. When that measurement is not available, and this is what people usually call the power management within a building, like smaller scale, like when you're talking about frequency, that doesn't make much sense. So let's look at the smaller scale within a building. So this is like one like small building, small office, we put the in, like IoT, connect everything, control center can send control signal to each appliance. So typical people, as that people want to do, as in, within a building, I want to maximize or minimize my cost to the utility company, like maximize utility, minimize the cost, and also guarantee the safety constraint, make sure the operation constraint within the building is satisfied, like the transformer constraint can be satisfied. So let's look, this smaller scale problem, as that what people usually do. Two-way communication, that's what people do. So from the control center, there's a hub. So the hub, every person can tell some information to the hub. The hub can send some information back. Then to coordinate, this can be still an iterative process until every person reach a good point. We can see this assumption when people develop the algorithm in literature. It's usually assumed perfect, reliable, also ubiquitous communication resource over the like, smart building. And let's take a Look at this. This is a question we're going to address. First, two-way communication. Like two-way communication, some people say, oh, yeah, once I build, I can make a two-way communication. But if I want to think about like smart neighborhood, like even for the NC state, we put every appliance, talk to some control center. You can imagine still we have millions active points in the systems. The first question is, is it possible for me to just remove one communication to just only one-way communication? In that way, probably I can just do the broadcast not using the radio to the podcast to coordinate the appliance. And that's the first question. If we can do the one-way communication, next one is how many bits is needed? When I, if I use the radio like to broadcast information, how much information I need? If I use the power line, can I just use a few bits to coordinate the whole systems? That's a question put in our mind. And the application, not just for like the smart building, I'm also working with the data center. So for the data center, like we have a millions like thousands of the clusters, and we have similar problem. We try to power management so different clusters to improve the energy efficiency. And even for the very small scale, when we go to the multi-core processor, similar problem exists. How we can reduce the communication to coordinate? Why is important? Look at in the literature, people can tell you, especially for the physical layer, communication cost is much, much higher than doing the local computation. I would rather prefer to do some local computation instead of putting the result to the communication. So that's more the question, how are we going to reduce the communication? So let's put the everything into the modeling. What kind of mathematical problem we talk about? So very simple problem here. Now, like, I don't worry about too much about the dynamics because everything, tries, <coughs> everything happens so fast. So this one, every appliance has a QI I want to achieve. And as a system together, I want to guarantee the total power consumption is within a limit. That's a problem. And each eye can think about the appliance. 
and this Q can be the power consumption total constraint within a building. So putting the setting, that's what we have. We have different appliances. Each appliance has certain utility function or some other function can come out, like something I care about. So control center want to make sure the cost, the total summation is smaller than certain bound. And the way they're going to do it through the two-way communication to coordinate. The two-way communication is try to control center send some price information or coordination signal. Each person can report some consumption signal back. So that's the stuff, setup we have. If we look at the problems, as I said, the problem is very simple and standard textbook problem. And people can use the standard dual algorithm to do it. So for those who are not familiar with the dual algorithm, a little bit of brief overview. So for this problem, we can have a, the dual problem is well formulated. So this is a dual problem called FP, introducing the P, the pricing information to coordinate everyone. And like for each person, once each appliance got the P, they will do the optimization to maximize their own profit, the U minus PQ. So this is the dual problem, like even from the textbook, it's very standard. Standard algorithm, using the dual gradient algorithm. Each time, how the appliance, how the control center update the price, it's just based on the deviation from the capacity and how much people is consuming now. If I have more capacity, I can like, reduce my price to make people can increase their consumption. So this algorithm is standard textbook dual algorithm. Let's put in the formula. What's the algorithm exactly talking about? Control center update coordination signal, price signal, according to the deviation from the power consumption and the capacity. So once he updates the price information sent to each user, each user got the information, then update their consumptions, solving the very simple optimization problem. So this is a two-way communication dual algorithm schemes. So what we are going to do? So from here, textbook says this algorithm can watch two Doppler solution very fast. If given the strong duality, this algorithm converge like linear convergence rate very fast. So what we're going to do is I said first, is it possible just broadcast information and don't need the information back from the users? Is this possible? So now we think about how we are going to do it. It's why I need information from individual person is I want to calculate the total power consumption from individual person. If individual person take the action self, this one, I can replace with the measurement QT instead of asking people to report me the information. And that's what I mean by making use of physical measurement. At the control center, that's it like in a hub, I can measure how much total power consumption from, I can measure the total consumption at that location instead of asking people to give me the information. So replace this with the true measurement, and now I can change the algorithms to the one-way communication, just send the price information to do it. This looks nice, right? Um, some questions we have is, previously, I don't need appliance to take the real physical action. They can wait until they find the, the good point. It's nice, it's a guarantee the system is not going to black out. Doing this way, what the difficulty we are going to have? The view we are going to have is, how it going to guarantee, because I ask people to take action through the process, how am I going to ask everyone to take the action in order to make sure the system not going to be blackout? That means the capacity constraint will be satisfied through the algorithm. This is how, like, looks like if I design the algorithm in a bad way, the system is going to be in a trouble. And secondly, as here, if I look at the algorithm, I need, like, measure the QT, report the information back, it looks like I need a synchronization. What synchronization remains? Once I got the information, I take the action. Then the control center needs to make sure when they measure the QT, everyone already takes the action. And that also looks impossible to do since I don't have the feedback information. How I know I should take the information now? So these two challenges make us to think about, is this possible for me to guarantee to avoid the two problems? So first thing, as I want to say for the synchronization, this one, by through some analysis, we can, if the step size and initial setting chosen in the right way, and we can guarantee even the system, the algorithm run asynchronously, it's still going to work. It's still going to cover to the point solution. So now the only question left is how we guarantee the system not going to have blackout. Guarantee through the process summation of QT smaller than Q. Interestingly, so that's actually I didn't expect when I developed the algorithm. Interesting is, Again, 
if the step size and initial points choose in the right way, and that's mathematically what I mean by choose the right way, then we can guarantee even during the process, the summation of the QIT will be smaller than Q all the time. Then we also avoid the blackout questions. And the two things, and this is even stronger, and we have some like convergence rate result because I also care about how fast I can achieve the optimal solution. And we even have some other adding small condition, we can even improve the convergence rate, make the system come really fast. This is like linear convergence rate, absolute convergence rate. So that's what we can achieve. Do the publication within the building and by making use of measurement. Now I just need to broadcast information and very simple way to do and like all the robustness already guaranteed. But let's think about the question again is, if I broadcast information, if I using like the power line communication, it's very fast, um, but it has limited bandwidth. Is it possible to do? Then the question is, can we further reduce the communication need? And if I can, for example, one question, if I can just broadcast one bit information, that's well, I have so many resources I can use. I can use the power line just one bit, every person based on one bit, do their calculation. So that's multi as a question, how are we going to quantize, how to quantize fast algorithm. So as I recall, this is the things we already have. We had the one-way communication using the gamma, the, it's kind of modified the dual gradient algorithm and replaced the QT, the summation QT to the real measurement. I said the question is further reduce communication. How are we going to further reduce the communication? So now let's look at here again, why, why report the information, this is a control center. So the way I update the price information is here, the QT minus Q. So what the new information each appliance get at each time is a PT. What the change of the PT? The change of the PT is this information. So as long as if everyone has information of the deviation from the QT minus Q, I don't need exactly the P. I only need to know whether the system now is good or not good. What that means is I can just send one information, indicate the sign, and let each person to think about what the P they should have. So this is the algorithm we're going to put. I will make each person try to think about what the price information they're going to have. So the control center now is a very simple job. So it will just measure if the QT, like constraints, is violated, but you can see we guarantee the constraints are not going to violate it. If you're going to violate, we send a one signal if it's satisfied, we send another signal. It's a binary signal. An individual person just do their own local computation on the price and then take their actions. So that's the way, that's a <coughs> this is the reduced communication method we're going to have. The question is, is this work? Does this work? So if you look at the algorithm, go back to I talk about dual problem. Look at the dual problem itself. Turns out this one is actually the normalized gradient descent method of the dual problem. Then again, for the textbook, we can guarantee it's going to work. As a brief, of a brief recap of what the normalized gradient algorithm means, think this is a dual optimization problem objective. So we want to minimize this cost and the gradient descent, that's what we have before. Gradient descent is calculate the gradient descent, update the price, and normalize is I'm going to normalize. I'm, I don't need accurate magnitude information, that'll do the normalization. So as I start from the textbook, this one going to work. As long as certain condition for the step size, that is going to converge. And now we look at this because our P so far is only one scalar variable. So the gradient is only one scalar. That's why it's normalized. This information here turns out to be one bit. That's the one I said, only binary signal indicates the constraint is valid, not valid, it's good enough. So the previous algorithm is one bit communication going to work. Let's take a deeper look. Is, is this really solve all the problem? So I keep using the very simple formulation. Think about the real problem. The real problem, even within the building, I have more constraint to satisfy. What that mean is, if this scalar is fine, only quantize one bit information. If the price information is not scalar, has a multiple dimension, how to think about the multiple dimension price? Within the building, we have some other power <coughs> operation constraint. Each constraint will call responding to one price information. And that means I have multiple dimensional price information. I need to coordinate and send information to individual person. So now the normalized gradient method can take any value in the unit sphere. And that means I need 
almost infinite bandwidth to send the normalized gradient information. So the, that's, as I said, corresponding to the multiple resource allocation problem for that. It's not going to work. So like, we haven't solved the problem exactly. So that's what we have to think about for the real case. Multiple dimension, multiple constraint. How are we going to do it? So translate to this problem. Now the P can be general, multiple dimension. I follow the idea. So now for the quantization, what quantization means. I take the gradient direction, tell me what direction to go. But as I said, I, have, I want to quantize. I, don't, I cannot know exactly every point in the S. I'm going to take a quantization set, D. D can be a finite set. So I will, no matter what kind of information I got, I will only take a, like a few, a finite set of the direction sent to the individual person. I'm going to do it. So this is a quantization. So D means a quantization set. The question to ask is, how am I going to study? So what's the objective? So when I design the quantized algorithm, when the quantization is a good quantization, how are we going to define a good quantization, a good algorithm? So follow that idea, because in reality, I don't know what the F. They think about the gradient descent method. When people design gradient descent method, it works for all the smooth, like convex function. It's not just for, works for one function. So motivate us to think about the definition. What, what do I mean by good quantization? A good quantization algorithm means even you change your F, but if I still follow the rule, the algorithm rule, it's still going to work. So we hope the quantization going to work, going to convert to a point solution. Even you change the F, that means for any well-behaved F, it should work. So that tells us the definition, like what we want to achieve when we think about quantization. So second, like other least question is, now how are we going to determine a quantization is good? Do you have a question? <laughs> so how to determine a quantization is good? Uh, what's the minimal size? I get, like one objective, I want to know the limit I can achieve. So what's the minimal size of the quantization? And that tells us how, what's the minimal communication I really need to call in the system. And the other question is, now I have the quantization, how am I going to really design the algorithm? How do you choose the quantization and how do you choose the step size? I should, this is a gamma t, not the epsilon t, sorry. So that the last question is, if we allow to use more communication, how are we going to use the more communication? That means what's the connection between the quantization set with the performance of the algorithm? So this is a list question when we look at here, we want to adjust in order to tell the like, industry engineer, like this is algorithm, what's unique? So let's think how we're going to think about the question. How the, why the gradient method works? Because the gradient method works is each time I take a descent direction. That, so when I think about quantization direction, so assume now I have a quantization, like three di direction. In order to make these quantizations enough, that means every time when I take has one gradient direction, I should be able to project to one of it. And then instead of, because I don't, I, can, I don't have this information, I cannot take this direction. Even if I take this direction, it should, it sh should still lead us to go to the descent direction. So that's the motivation for us to think about when the quantization should work. So follow this intuition, uh, we define certain quantization way, like we call it the CDAR cover. What the CDAR cover means is now for this one, so we have the CDAR angle between the gradient direction and the quantization direction. So the theorem says if we want the quantization to work, then we need to make sure the theta cover almost cover everything in the space that we need. So this is sufficient natural condition. The intuition tells us this is the least amount we need. For the least one, what we can show is given a multiple dimension, multiple resource allocation problem, the minimal probable quantization is k plus one. And how many bits we need? The bit is the log k plus one. It's actually very surprising is we change the infinite bandwidth problem to be very, very few. So that's the reason why the problem I showed before, we only need the one bit of communication because we only have one constraint, k is one, so we only need the one bit. That's enough for us to go. And this is a minimal, sufficient necessary. Yeah, question. How much theta in your minimal? Uh, what? The, the angle theta, so you called it a theta yeah. cover. Uh, so for the two dimension is like you only need a, it's actually not like 90, so the angle between the that one 
is the like one like two like it's pi. But for the quantization theta is the, like pi over two, yeah. But for the more general like the multiple dimension case is more complicated thing. But like when you define the angle you have multiple dimensions, you can still use that. I will yeah. Yes. It is. It is. So we uh, we have a. I will show you later. We actually read that paper. We tried to use the result to derive the uh, op, like upper bound, lower bound. Now we only you can see we only have the. I think this is the lower bound. Like we don't. Uh, if we try to connect the theta, like do the theta covering, we still don't have the like sufficient natural condition. So I mean, we just the question here we answer the is what the minimal able to do, and this will correspond to like the theta equal pi over two. So now we try to connect, like as I said, we also want to study the connection between the quantization and the convergence. So we try to study the convergence rate result because you can imagine if I have more information in the quantization set, I can converge much faster because I have like more information. So this is captured intuition. So based on like the convergence result is how much step in order for me to reach this step, at least that's the definition we define is when the gradient is very small. We define that as the stopping criterion. And this will be upper bounded by the value, like in this is a that cover. And this should be the gamma two, uh, oh, this is the epsilon, and also the gamma step size. So this is complicated to uh, identify the message from here. The message is like the intuition, is final quantization, large step size is allowed, and final quantization, faster convergence. And this is intuitive. But the question, like back to the question is, exactly how the quantization set is related to the convergence speed is still an open question for our work now because the convergence speed we had is connection with the theta. If you want to know how the theta cover determines the entire quantization set is related to like the channel like 1959, I think this is a paper you refer to. So like we go to that, we have a, it has some like upper bound, lower bound, but we cannot show the tightness of that bound. We can easily come out some way to say how the theta connect to the quantization side, but it's not like tight for that one. So like as a summary, so this is what we have. So a proper quantization, like equivalent to the theta cover, like the theta will larger than the pi over two, smaller than pi over two. So minimal size, this one is a k plus one should be log of k plus one and pick the quantization direction. So now from here, this intuition, when we have quantization set, how are we going to pick the design the algorithm? Intuitively, you pick the quantization direction that's closer to the gradient direction. And theta plays an important role to determine the quantization rate. And this is the simulation result. You can see how the quantization work. Surprisingly is, so this one, this is the gradient method without normalization. You know, like for this method, you're going to converge like linear convergence rate, this linear convergence rate. And look at this one. So those, this is uh, using two bit to quantize the normalized gradient method. And this is using three bit, and this is using four bit. And the black one is simulation of the normalized gradient method. It's not down to any quantization, but just normalized gradient method. We compare this because our method is to quantize the normalized gradient direction method. So the surprising thing is we can see alone like four bit achieves exact same performance with the infinite bandwidth, like same performance as the normalized gradient method. But this has a big gap, you can from here see. So the normalized gradient method does not perform as well as the gradient method because gradient method also tells people the gradient information, not just the direction, also tells the magnitude. So what the message I want to say is from those simulation study, also we have superior natural condition between the normalized gradient method. The measure is we should find a way to coordinate the magnitude information of the gradient instead of just doing the gradient direction. So that's the message of that. So as a summary, so that would have been like hopefully now you're convinced we can combine those tools to reduce communication needs for the coordination in power grid. So first I showed the low frequency control. This one we really like try to model the power grid dynamics, how we're going to make the power dynamic to do it. And this one for the slower time, like for the small neighborhood, we can use the power like for the power allocation problem. So we can like just everything change so fast. We can just look at the optimization using the <coughs> quasi-dynamic system and to do it. And secondly, if you want to further reduce the communication, 
the way we can like think about do the quantization. But I said there are different ways to do the quantization. What we showed is a quantization quantized the direction. So questions, like a lot of questions left is here you can see I have a I kind of choose a like different set of the problem I'm going to address. So in reality when we talk <coughs> when we promote the smart grid in the future, like the Internet of Things, how we call it the whole grid together, from transmission level to the distribution level to the each like building or each house. So it has a hard problem is how we're going to choose the right algorithm for a different level of the problem. And then once we choose the different algorithms, like say the transmission level, we use some frequency control, distribution network, like we use some the power allocation scheme I showed to you, how are we going to combine them together? So we need to integrate them together because all these things are going to affect each other. So what the right architecture should be for the power grid? And this is very difficult, uh, but very important question to really promote everything. And to answer this question, we need to really understand the trade-off between them. So here I kind of just focus on one dimension, communication, say, can I reduce communication but still guarantee efficiency? I didn't talk about like, robustness much, and also commercial speed, we haven't got the, all the results. So you can imagine now we, I push one direction, some other direction probably will go bad. So how to, like, how to capture like, the whole spectrum of the algorithm, because this is important for us to think about the architecture design, because at different level of power grid probably care about different things. So we choose different algorithms, a different layer, and then to combine them together in order to promote the whole Smart grid. And thank you so much. Questions? Yeah. Can you be louder? I cannot hear you. Sorry. How about that? Is there a certain, I don't know how close that have to be, is there a certain saturation of the technology that has to be in place so that the algorithms can take advantage of communicating the, the power load that's needed? Uh, you said, is there a saturation on the device data? So like the, the before, like w as we get closer to like a smart grid where you can uh, apply um, the, uh, the determination of what power to distribute out to each of the, the different users or end, end nodes, um, you, the, the types of people that don't want to go into that smart or don't buy appliances that use that kind of technology that, that could like one off, um, like that's another potential okay, so loss. I, I think your question is uh, for, like, for example, for people like us, how we can apply those algorithms in our life, right? Uh, so if you, I was, uh, for that one, actually, I was surprised, like, because I uh, work with some friends, they want to do startup, and like, we try to build a smart HVAC system, it's like, like for the central HVAC, how can we, for the individual room, have different temperature? Then we go to look at, uh, like, even Amazon, you will find there's a lot of devices already exist, for the smart plug, smart kit, like you don't need to change your appliance. It just you just change the like those the plug, and it works. A lot of things are available. I was suggest if some of you think about startup, probably it's a good like good time to go now. A lot like Samsung, all the companies has, and very cute, yeah. Device. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, one is that when you talk about the uh, primal dual gradient this algorithm, uh, you mentioned that the step size should fall into a range. Yes. Yes. I wonder, do you have a tuning way to guarantee the fastest convergence? Um, because when we, in fact, when we uh, do that, uh, when we use that algorithm, we, we don't know how to tune the parameters. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in theory. In, so you look at here, like this is step size, and the step size here. In theory, if you pick a step size bigger, then you should converge. I think this one bigger. This is a little bit harder to say. Look at here, this is a quadratic. So for this problem, we actually can analyze what's the optimal step size. And the optimal, optimal step size will, again, depending on the problem itself, this is a property. Like every person, the L is the property of the cost function. So when you choose the 
step size. If you know the cost function you have, then you can base on the cost function probably using this one, then you can tilt the step size. Yeah, so I, I think your problem probably will be different, right? But in almost all the problem, it depending on the problem, like the FP, based on that structure, it will work, yeah. For different algorithms, they are different. For different algorithms, they have different way to tune the parameters. That what that I want to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another question is that you talk about the core allocation theory. I I'm, it, it seems to me that there is still a control factor to figure to uh, mm -hmm. to figure uh, this information. Yes. I wonder what do you think about the four distributed. Uh. So we. Uh. Yeah. So the four distributed is also able. So like. Then it will be different. By different, what I mean is here, why to, uh, look at the control center is actually what happens now. Like usually we have, we have a hub at a certain place. So that we, the motivation doing that, like even for the data center, they have like monitor can measure that. And the algorithm when you go to the full distributed, the mesh, we sometimes call it the mesh network. Then for the mesh network, you can definitely algorithm should change. It's not like the dual gradient. You should change the algorithm using some other way. And we have some results on that. But then the way, say, how are we going to make use of the physical measurement? It's kind of trade-off, right? If you ask each appliance to measure the local like physical variables, you know, more sensing resource for all the appliances. And so that's some trade-off between the sensing, communication, and computation that I'm talking about. But for the algorithm part, definitely it's okay. We can do that. Yeah. No, so that's why I'm saying it's not necessary to be better. So it's really depending on the resource you have. Uh, I can still use the smart tree VC example as an example. For that one, so we, uh, we actually we are going to build the two, like the fully distributed, di di uh, like fully distributed and also the control center one. Control center one has the advantage is a power resource. Like when I put additional for the each, like you think about each fund, I'm going to change the fund control mechanism. Also, when I need to do the contractor, I need to take a computation. Computation will take a power. If at that, if at that location, it's not easy for me to have those elites to guard the charge it. Then I want to save the energy resource. So then for the, like, the second one, I have a control center, talk to each one. The control center I can put at any place I can measure. And that's why I don't need to worry about the, the power resource. Then for individual person, just take the command and then take action. And so like, not much they need to do. So in terms of that one, you can see the like one too many has an advantage. But when you talk about uh, like robustness, for that one, even one like AC fails, I mean other persons still can talk to each other, has more robustness. And also about like some people probably don't like additional new control hub at home. Or I just want to change everything, don't change the looking of my house. Then you can also think the mesh has an advantage. It's really depending case by case. That's, my, that's what I ever say depending what we need. At different level, probably like different algorithm is needed. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker again.